Thank you, Chris. Yeah, just move this out so you don't okay. trip over. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm thrilled to be able to be here and teach this week for you. And um, I do recognize some faces in the class, too, because I got to teach in an Awakened DTS. And so I recognize some staff and students. So if you're from that school, will you raise your hand? I've seen some of you around campus. But yeah, it's good to see you again. And I look forward to reconnecting with you guys as well. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to start out. I'll add a little bit more to what Chris said about me, just because when I have to listen to somebody speak, it always helps if I know a little bit about who they are first. So um, this first picture is me with uh, refugees from Bhutan. And in my YWAM career, this has been my main focus, is working with refugees that were kicked out of Bhutan because of their faith in Christ. They were beaten, tortured, and then given the choice to either renounce their faith or leave the country. And they chose to leave for the sake of the gospel. And they were ethnically Nepali, so they went to Nepal, and the United Nations settled them in refugee camps there. And a woman from the Philippines came and opened a Bible school for them, which was an answer to their prayers. Because most of them had become Christians through miraculous healings, like either they or a family member were miraculously healed. So they knew God had power, but they didn't know anything really at all about what it meant to actually follow him. They had just heard there's a God who can heal you and God healed them. So they're like, wow, we owe you our lives and they followed him. And so um, Titus Project, which I'll share a little bit more about later, but it's kind of like the outreach for the School of Biblical Studies. Uh, we got involved in the school and on my first Titus outreach, I got to go and work at this Bible school, which was just this simple half constructed house in the middle of nowhere, Nepal. And, um, it, God just touched my heart so much when I went there. I had never even heard of Bhutan before I was going to go on this outreach. And if any of you don't know where it is, it's, um, it's above India and below China next to Nepal. So just between India and China in the Himalayas. And so, um, yeah, God really touched my heart. And when the two-month outreach was over, I didn't want to go home. And I stayed an additional two months. And then I went back there. Uh, every year for as long as I could, as long as my visa would allow for about, um, about 10 years that I was able to work there with the Bhutanese. And our prayer was always that they'd be able to go back to Bhutan, but that door has not opened yet. Bhutan is still incredibly close to the gospel. Um, but after 17 years in refugee camps, the United Nations began to resettle the Bhutanese refugees in different places around the world. And now most of the families that I worked with are now living, in some, many in the U.S., some in Canada, and some in other countries around the world. Like this particular family, this is one of my very favorite families, um, Kisan and Esther and their kids, but they now live in Oregon and are pastoring there. And it's so great because they were all pastors and leaders within the refugee camps, and now they're pastoring and leading congregations of Bhutanese and Nepali people in the nations that they have been resettled in. And many Hindus have come to the Lord. The, the um, majority of Nepali people are Hindu um, and of the refugees as well. And they weren't very open to the gospel while they were still in the refugee camps, but since they've um, been taken out of that environment and brought into the United States, many, many, many of them have come to know the Lord. And so it's just so wonderful how God can take your life and use it and how one little outreach can change everything for you because that's kind of what happened for me. And so, um, yeah, that was just, that's a little bit of my YWAM story and the people group that I'm most passionate about, although I love many, many nations in the world as well. So while I was staffing Titus Project, a little bit of my story, I'm actually 41 years old and I didn't think that I would get married. I thought that ship had kind of sailed for me, but I was leading a Titus outreach and we went to Chile and Bolivia and there's this really handsome guy on my team. His name is Ryan. <laughs> But I never thought of him as a, a marriage partner because he was 10 years younger than me. And so we were just friends during the outreach, but then he came. Um, <laughs> I lived in Montana working with YWAM for about um, 15 years and would go back and forth to Nepal from there. And I didn't think anything of that, but then he came to Montana and studied Hebrew for a while and our relationship deepened and then 
he told me he had feelings for me. And guys, that's a tough thing to do. So, you know, you can probably identify with that, some of you. And some of you are maybe dreading the day in the future when you have to do that. And um, you also have to sympathize with the girl, though, because we don't know the questions coming. Like, you get all this time to prepare, but we didn't know that that was the day you were going to ask that kind of question. Or, you know, so he, it really threw me off guard because I just wasn't thinking of him in that way. And I said no to him. And <laughs> so <laughs> that was a dark day. And I thought I, thought I would never, because he was leaving Montana at that time and want, going to Mexico to help pioneer the School of Biblical Studies in Tijuana. And I thought, I'll never hear from him again. This is going to be the end of this great friendship. Just because that's kind of how it had gone in the past sometimes, is, you know, if you, when it's a no, then it's like they, the love turns to hate. And I don't know, it happens to girls and guys. I'm sure all of you have found yourselves possibly in those situations. But anyway, our relationship continued through Skype. And so God and Skype get the credit for us being a couple. <laughs> and, uh, and we started, our, our relationship really got more spiritual because you know there's not a whole lot you can do on Skype except for talk. So uh, we started reading the Bible together and reading Christian books together and praying together. And I started to think, you know, maybe this is the man that God would have for me. I mean, what kind of man does those things with you, you know? And so after seeking a lot of wise counsel from different leaders and everything, I went to teach in Mexico in the SBS that he had helped pioneer there. And I told him that I would be his girlfriend. And so that was the beginning of our story. There's another long story in there that's funny, but I'll maybe save that for another day. And then um, a little while after that, he proposed to me in a vineyard, and he got down on one knee, so he did a great job. He's not that kind of guy, so this was like really stretching for him. And so if any of you guys need help, oh, he, there he is. He's right in the back of the room right now. <laughs> baby Jude. We didn't get to that part of the story, but that's the best part. So. <laughs> um, so yeah, if any of you guys need help with um, proposing to the ladies, you know, you can talk to Ryan. Last year when I came, several guys who were dating other girls, also older girls, also sought us out for counsel. So if you find yourself in need of something like that, we can give you wise counsel. <laughs> but I would just say to you, never tell God no. Don't tell him I'll only marry this kind of person or I would never marry that kind of a person because God knew what was right for us and Ryan is exactly the right man for me. And I, if I had just had my preconceived ideas, I would have missed what God was doing. So listen to the Lord. We got married in Montana in um, June of 2013. So we're coming up on three years. I know I was a lot skinnier then. I need to get back to there, but... <laughs> um, and then this is our families, and also, he's going to hate me for doing this, but Ryan's twin brother Taylor is here mission building right now, and he's single, ladies. <laughs> so, um, yeah, if you, he's right here. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, if you, if you think Ryan's pretty cool, there's actually a second chance out there for a guy as cool as Ryan. So. <laughs> Um, and his dad's actually here too, helping to um, redo the campus pool. So I don't know if that will get done in time for you guys to use it, but um, they're pool builders by trade and they've just come to lend their expertise in, in that project. And so it's great that we can be here together, um, kind of as that part of the family. And then in my family, um, my unique part of the story is that I am the oldest of five daughters and all of us have done DTS and SBS. And one of my sisters did Titus. And then my father sadly passed away of cancer, and my mom did the Crossroads Discipleship Training School. So I think we should get to do everything for free from now on in YWAM. I don't know that YWAM agrees, but um, it's just been really great to see how God has, um, yeah, just brought fruitfulness in our families. And um, I mean, I'm sure all of you would love it if your siblings and parents could experience what you've experienced in doing YWAM. And so don't give up hope. God could have that happen. And it's definitely happening in Ryan's family now, too, as he's got family members here serving in missions. And we'll just see what 
God has in the future for that as well. So um, I wanted to share with you a little bit about Titus Project, just so that you know what it is. Um, but actually, Ryan, do we need to feed Jude? OK, we're good? OK. Um, yeah, just so you know, we might have some unscheduled breaks because Jude still needs me to feed him. <laughs> so um, I know you'll really cry about extra breaks because students hate it when there's breaks during class. But try to just bear it, and we'll get through. So. But anyway, um, this is a little bit about uh, Titus Project, the ministry that we work with, and I just thought I would show that to you guys. Titus Project is a school that really embodies the core of youth with a mission. You take graduates of the School of Biblical Studies, people who know God, who have studied His Word, and you equip them to make Him known in the nations. We spend three weeks equipping students with the skills they need to teach cross-culturally, teach communities of oral communicators who don't know how to read or write, how to tell story, how to properly organized teachings for schools such as the School of Biblical Studies around the world or even preparing sermons in churches. Through this equipping, we build confidence in them and help them understand the heart of a teacher. After the three weeks of equipping, Titus teams are sent out to bring the Word of God to places that could not get it otherwise. Titus Project is a ministry that started here in Montana but it has grown around the world. We now have 13 operating locations where SBS graduates are trained and sent in their own area of the world. This ministry is called Titus Project because of the book of Titus in the Bible, particularly Titus 1.1, where Paul says that he is an apostle for the sake of God's people and their knowledge of truth which accords with godliness. And people can't live godly lives if they don't know the truth of scripture. And we desire to see transformation take place as believers become more rooted and grounded in truth. Another reason that the book of Titus is an inspiration to us is Titus is someone that Paul would send to the hard places. And we feel called to focus on places that are unreached and places where there's not a lot of other people going and not much Bible training taking place. We call those who participate in Titus participants and not students because we see them as fellow teachers. And as we go out on outreach, we travel together as a team of teachers and not a leader and students. In the time that you spend in Titus Project, you will learn to teach and you'll actually do a practice teaching four times during the training time and then be continually evaluated on outreach. And our goal is that after completing the program, you'll go on to a lifetime of Bible teaching, whether that's back at your home church or in the nation that God calls you to. The audience you'll have when teaching in Titus Project can vary. On my Titus Outreach, we taught pastors from local churches. We taught YWAMers. We taught people from rural villages. We taught ex-Muslims, ex-militants. And they were all there for the same purpose with the same hunger, and that was for the Word of God and the truth of who Jesus is. Not only does Titus Project equip you to become an effective teacher and preacher of God's Word, but it gives you a heart for the nations and a heart for God's Word that is unlike anything you'll find in any other YWAM school. The most exciting thing about Titus Project is seeing School of Biblical Studies graduates equipped to pass on what they learned to places where there really is a desperate need for Bible teaching. The world is full of believers who have not had any access to training and sometimes even pastors and leaders who are leading congregations but have never had any chance for formal training. And a lot of times they can't leave what they're doing and we want to be there to take the training to them and pass on just the simple tools of inductive Bible study so that they can better feed themselves and their congregations. Don't let all the truth that you gained during your school of biblical studies stop now. Take the risk of stepping out. Invest it in the kingdom of God. There will be fruit because God says his word never returns void. So I have just loved being able to work with Titus Project. And it's actually a miracle that I do because I hated school growing up and I particularly hated teachers. I had some really, really bad teachers that made me, I couldn't even imagine teachers were really people 
that they like ate food and had families and stuff like that. To me, they were just like evil creatures that lurked in the school. It was really sad. But it definitely takes a miracle to take somebody like me and have God use me now to actually be one of those evil, horrible people, <laughs> which hopefully I'm not really evil and horrible. But um, it, it took God's word bringing transformation in my life to make me get over some of those preconceived ideas and fears that I had about the classroom setting and turn me into a teacher. So, um, yeah, you never know what God's going to do with your life. And a lot of times his plans for our life look so much different than we would have thought that our our plan would look like. And I'm so thankful that God chose me and used me, even in my weakness, to be able to be a part of his plan. And so if any of you guys do end up going on after this, which I would highly encourage you to, and um, do the, the nine-month school biblical studies, you're going to be like the star students if you do that, because you're getting so well equipped here in DBS. Um, but yeah, we would love to have you come and work with Titus Project uh, anywhere at any of our operating locations around the world. We actually have 15 of them now where you can go and get trained and sent out in, around every continent, praise be to God. And we just love to see Bible teachers released uh, to share what they've learned in the nations. So yeah, we'll see. Hopefully some of you will show up someday to do Titus Project. So um, I was going to show you a little bit about our campus in Mexico, but I'm going to skip that because we're running late on time. Oh my goodness, I have the wrong PowerPoint up. I th there was a couple of things I thought were missing, and so I was confused, but okay, hold on. Okay. So now we're going to switch gears and start to think about the prophets again. And so last week you guys started the prophets, right? Was that your first week in the prophets? Had any of you guys read the prophets very much before coming to do DBS? Yes. Some of you had, yeah? That's awesome. They're actually, I think, some of the least read parts of the Bible. And that's because they're very misunderstood. People don't feel comfortable reading them because, honestly, it's kind of depressing a lot of it. And then they feel even less confident to even teach or preach out of it. So I feel like the prophets have been pretty neglected by the church. And that's something I'm really passionate about seeing change. And actually, prophecy is the largest literary genre in the Bible. There are 17 books of the Bible that fit under the genre of prophecy. And so to skip them means that we would miss out on a, a big piece of the heart of God. And of course, we never want to miss out on a piece of the heart of God and how he has revealed himself. Um, but I too was, I, I read it through the Bible in my DTS for the first time. We had a speaker challenge us to read all the way through the Bible. And I had tried in the past and been very unsuccessful. I'd get to Leviticus and every time that did me in and I wasn't successful. But I just prayed and I said, God, I know I'm supposed to love your word and I don't. And I just need you to change my heart. And he actually heard my prayer and changed my heart. And I read a lot of my Bible by candlelight in a village in the northern Philippines. And the Bible was the same Bible, I was the same person, but God did a miracle in changing my heart to give me a hunger for the word. But I had no concept of the fact that the Bible wasn't all chronological. So after I finished, you know, Kings and Chronicles, and then there's the wisdom literature and all that, and then when I got to the prophets, I thought it was a continuation in history from that point on. And so every book was like, you know, sin and judgment, sin and judgment, sin and judgment, then restoration, and then I'd I think the next book would talk about something different, but it would be the same thing all over again. And I didn't know that the prophecies were actually spoken during the times of the kings. So if you guys know that, you know more than I did <laughs> when I started, re <clears throat> started excuse me, reading the prophets. Um, but along with that, I grew up in the, uh, the part of the church that was pretty charismatic. And our approach to the prophets was very much what I would call the, the newspaper or news media approach that we would look in the prophets and then we'd watch TV or read the newspaper and then pretty much figure out right from there uh, what could possibly, what everything could possibly mean. We assumed all of it was for our day and our time. So I had a lot of really weird views uh, about prophecy because of that. And I'm not saying that there's not things in prophecy that aren't about today or the future. There definitely are. But when I came to study the prophets, and I'm sure you guys, if you've done a big chunk of them already, have found, oh wow, a lot of these things actually have already been fulfilled. They might have been future to the people they were prophesied to, but we live so far 
removed from them in history that a lot of those events were actually past events for us, that when we look back, we can see that they've already been fulfilled. And so, I don't know, did you guys talk, if you, if, we, if you did this last week, you can stop me, but I just wanted to do a little prophecy quiz with you, so to talk about um, how much of prophecy is about the New Testament and so forth. So, um, what percentage of prophecy has to do with the New Covenant? What do you guys think? What percentage would you guess? Did you cover this last week? No? Okay, we'll throw out some guesses and then I'll reveal the right answer. What, so that means anything to do with Jesus, anything from Jesus forward. What percentage of Old Testament prophecy? 17.7? 20. 20. 20. I, okay, talk louder. I can't hear who's saying what. 30? 40? 25. 28. 28. Okay, well, let's do a drum roll and... You know, isn't that crazy? Somebody was right on the dot. Who was right on the dot? Anybody? Wow, good job back there. I forgot your name. Steven. Steven. Good to see you, Steven. So anyway, um, yeah, less than 5% of what we read in Old Testament prophecy actually has to do with the new covenant, like things, you know, in the time of Jesus forward. And that was a really shocking thing for me to learn. And these statistics come from a, a book called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, which is a really good biblical resource to, um, to look at. And it's on the chapter on prophecy. So 5% has to do with the new covenant, anything from Jesus forward. Our next question is, what percentage of prophecy is actually messianic, meaning it talks specifically about Jesus? Like Jesus, the Messiah, his suffering, his, his work on the cross. One percent. Okay, you guys are yeah. You guys are good. You really brought your numbers down. Okay, just do the drum roll again. Less than two percent. Your accuracy is greatly improved. So yeah, that's only only less than two percent actually has to do with with Jesus as the Messiah. And then finally, our last question is: What percentage of prophecy is still unfulfilled? Like, like, we're still waiting for the prophecies to see the fulfillment. How much? Less than three. Less than three. Anyone else? Less than, one. less than one. Yeah, that's actually the right answer. I won't make you do the drum roll. But, um, yeah, less than one percent. So, you guys, that, 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 that needs to help change our thinking on prophecy, that when we read it, yes, there's things unfulfilled. Yes, there's things about the new covenant in there. But we shouldn't do what I grew up doing, and that is thinking that all of it, like 100%, has to do with our time in history or in the future from us. Because by doing that, we miss out on one of the main things that we need to know as we do inductive method of Bible study is in interpretation, do we ask, what does it mean to me? No. No. What do we ask? Yeah, what did it mean to them, to the original people it was written to? And prophecy doesn't have meaning for people if, if it's completely like for something thousands and thousands of years past their lifetime. Now, some of those things are, but the majority were things that the people that these prophecies were written to saw at least partial fulfillments of in their own day, or it was fulfilled shortly after the lifetime of the prophet. And just knowing that really changes our approach, and then we want to look more at um, biblical history or even secular history to see kind of some of the fulfillments of things that we read in the prophets and that's going to help us have a greater understanding of what the prophecies actually mean so that we can apply them to our lives because they still are for us God wanted us to read them that's why he included them in the Bible but we have to have an understanding of what it first meant to the original people it was written to before trying to apply it to our own situation so um, Break is usually 10.15 or 10.30? 10.15? Okay, great. We'll shoot for that. All right. Let's get into the book of Jeremiah then and um, talk about Jeremiah. He's known as the weeping prophet. And how far have you guys got in your reading of Jeremiah? You're, you finished the whole thing? Okay, awesome. That's perfect. I didn't know if you were still working your way um, through it or not. But... Um, yeah, did you guys see some weeping done by Jeremiah as you read through this book? Was it really easy for him to be a prophet and he was like walking in victory all the time and glad that he got called? No. 
he really wrestled with the calling that God put on his life. And I love studying the book of Jeremiah because I think that um, we need to have a balance to I, what I guess I would call the glory stories we hear about ministry. And there are glory stories, and Jeremiah has glory stories about the awesome things God did, but then there's also the times where being obedient to the call of God just is really tough. And, and you want to quit, and you regret sometimes saying, God, do whatever you want with my life, because he may ask you to do things with your life that are a lot harder and more painful than you would have expected. And if we only hear the amazing stories, then sometimes when our own life experience isn't victory to victory and, you know, everywhere we go, thousands of people come to know the Lord and we always have that perfect outreach team where everyone gets along and you pray 24 hours a day and people are healed and raised from the dead. You know, when those things don't always happen, then we can tend to think, you know, well, maybe there's, maybe I'm not called, maybe, uh, maybe this isn't for me, maybe I should quit. But what we really see from the lives of the prophets, and we know more about Jeremiah than all of the rest of the prophets combined. He, we have more biographical detail on him than any of the others. So when we look at his life, we can see that being faithful to God doesn't always mean living this victorious life where you're popular with everyone and everyone, your ministry is always fruitful. That's not always realistic. And it's a really important thing for us to know that when we say yes, that we just need to obey God no matter what, and that the fruit belongs to him, and also the lack of fruit, we just have to be faithful to preach the word, whether people want to hear it or not. And of course we need to examine our lives and say, Lord, is there something that's hindering my ministry? We want to always keep that humble heart before God. But I think from seeing in the prophets, the prophets were men that were very obedient to God. But at the same time, they went to hard-hearted people, and there wasn't a lot of fruit from their ministry. Like, can you imagine writing newsletters as these guys to your supporters? Like, well, I'm still preaching, and I at least didn't get thrown in prison for a few weeks, and uh, I haven't gotten any tomatoes thrown at me. You know, I mean, that's not very inspiring type of newsletters to write. And yet, those were the lives that they lived in obedience to God, and their lives were very fruitful because everything that they prophesied did take place, and then future generations, as they looked back and read over it, they did repent and they did change. And even us here today sitting in this classroom are going to benefit from the life of Jeremiah as we study and learn from the way he lived and, and who he was as a person. And so, yeah, we don't always see the fruit of our sacrifices for God, but there always will be fruit. It just may not be in our immediate vision when we want it to be, to keep us motivated and inspired to keep going. So we're going to talk a lot about that this week, because Ezekiel also had an incredibly difficult call, and he prophesied around the same time. Daniel suffered a lot for um, following Jesus. So it's just a week that deals a lot with the not glorious parts of being obedient to the call of God on your life. And I think that's just, again, something really important for us to acknowledge as believers. So as far as the big picture or theme of the book, I'd say that it's a lot about judgment, obviously, but that it's with a heart of restoration. And just kind of as an example of this, I have this child here that is very angry at their parent. <laughs> and, um, you know, right now our baby's like not even a year old, so we don't have rebellion to deal with or anything like that. But a good parent, and there are bad parents, obviously, but just speaking about a good parent, a good parent would <laughs> want to... Um, discipline bad behavior out of their child out of love for the child and because they don't want that bad behavior to hold their child back. And some of you are parents and you can probably identify with that. Like if Jude grows up and he has a problem with lying, it wouldn't be good for Ryan and I as parents to just let him be a liar. You know, because that will destroy every relationship that he ever has. You can't trust somebody who lies and without trust you can't have a relationship. Right? So if we would discipline him for lying, it's not because we're like, oh, you're a worthless kid. It would be, no, we love you, but we want to see this bad behavior cleansed out of you for your own good. And with God sending judgment on his people, it's with that same father heart that he's not wanting to reject his people or he doesn't want them to be his people anymore. It's that he wants to cleanse them of these things that are inhibiting them from being who he created them to be as the light to the nations and his chosen people. And what we'll see, this, this book and everything we're gonna deal with this week 
talks about the, the exile of, of Judah and the fall of Jerusalem. And so those are really depressing things to read about. I know you've already looked at them in Kings and um, probably talked about some of the aspects of that, and we're going to look at it again. But it's really sad to read about the horrors that happened as that all took place. But what you guys are going to find when you go into the post-exilic period starting next week is that exile did accomplish the purpose that God wanted it to accomplish. And what you're going to find is when you read the post-exilic prophets, that something totally has changed. And instead of them prophesying to hard hearts, in every post-exilic prophet, when they prophesy, the people repent. And that's a beautiful thing. They, they learned from exile. And a lot of them never even came back from exile. They just got lost among the nations and never chose to come home. But those who did return from the exile came back with a heart of really wanting to serve God and really wanting to be true to him. And so they didn't struggle that much anymore. We don't read a lot about idolatry or immorality or the main, some of the main things that we see as being the struggle of the Jews up to this point. Wouldn't you guys say you've seen a lot of them struggling with that up till now? Well, you're not going to see a lot of that post-exile. In fact, even going into the New Testament, we see them facing a different struggle, and that's the struggle of self-righteousness. You've got the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and now the people of God, as we find them in the New Testament, um, have become so spiritual that they almost don't think they need a savior. And so their pendulum almost swings all the way to the other side from going from just like being you know, idolaters, not even worshiping God, to instead thinking they're so holy that they don't even need God. So there's a lot of transition that takes place in this time, and exile did accomplish the purpose that God wanted it to accomplish. And so, um, yeah, just keep that father heart in mind as we go through this. And so um, what we're going to do now, just before our break, is I'm going to have you guys do a little workshop on Chapter 2. And um, what I want you guys to do is, is get with at least one other person. It can just be your table, or if there's too many of you at your table, um, just get with at least one other person. And I want you guys to look through chapter 2. And chapter 2 is kind of a good summary of the whole message of Jeremiah. But I want you to go through it, and, and, and within this chapter, you will see represented the major sins that the people are being condemned for. Through God, by God through the prophet Jeremiah. So what I want you to look for is what are the main sin categories that you see represented in chapter 2. Does that make sense? All right, do that together, and as you come across different things, write it down and then try to categorize it into um, a couple categories of different, different sins that the people are being condemned for. All right? Try to read it out loud because it will help you guys be on the same page. <laughs> True. <laughs> 